us uh, for the program this evening, Creating a Culture of Consent. This is our parent session. As you may have noticed, we have a session this evening for parents and a session tomorrow for teens. And this session is being hosted by our Choose Respect Montgomery initiative, which is designed at reducing teen dating violence, uh, reducing the incidence of sexual assault, and learning about consent and what that looks like in relationships and in general for our teens and really for everyone. We're pleased tonight to partner with the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and in a few moments, you'll hear from Beth Wincoop, who's going to be our presenter this evening. Beth is a prevention and education policy advocate for the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault. She has been working in the field of interpersonal violence response and prevention for the past decade, and is passionate about ending violence through community engagement and empowerment. Before coming to MCASA, she was a senior trainer at Altruistic, home of the Green Dot Program, where she created curriculum, conducted research, and delivered training focused on primary prevention to national audiences, including campuses, communities, high schools, the Department of Defense, the National Park Service. At MCASA, Ms. Wincoop provides trainings and technical assistance to both professionals and students on topics related to prevention, including bystander intervention, community engagement, evaluation, and prevention policies. My name is Debbie Feinstein, as you can see from the screen. I am the Chief of the Special Victims Division for the Montgomery County State's Attorney's Office. I'm a prosecutor in my primary role, but I also have the privilege of serving as the Chair of the Domestic Violence Coordinating Council, which is a, co a coordinated group of individuals in our county that are, again, dedicated to preventing uh, domestic violence in our community. I want to welcome tonight some of our partners. We have representatives from the Family Justice Center, Smith Avaria. We have Kathy Green and Shella Cherry from Montgomery County Public Schools. And we have Lieutenant Jerry McFarland from the Montgomery County Police Department. Welcome to them, and we hope that you have an informative program this evening. A few guidelines. We ask you to keep your video and sound muted. I think you may not even have the option to turn them on, but just in case, um, please keep them muted. Uh, you can use the chat function during the course of the presentation. And during the course of the presentation, you'll have the option to go to questions, which is Meredith. So if you have technical questions or other questions during the presentation, please send them to Meredith and she can then feed them to Beth um, or to others of us that are co-hosting this program this evening. If you have questions in Spanish, preguntas en español, you can send them to the host information. It's actually a woman named Mary Ariola from my office who will be answering your questions in Spanish, and you can obviously send them in Spanish as well. Welcome everyone, and with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Wincoop to give the presentation. Hey, uh, thank you, Debbie. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, it's great to see so many people coming out. Um, as Debbie said, my name is Beth Wincoop. Um, I am the Prevention and Education Policy Advocate at the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Um, I am a Silver Spring resident, so I live right here in Montgomery County. Um, just to give you a little bit about this person, I feel like when we're talking through a screen, it can feel very impersonal. Um, I am a big lover of animals. I put a picture of my dog up there because um, I'm hoping this doesn't happen, but there's always a chance she will hop in as a co-presenter if she decides to start barking during the presentation. We're hoping that doesn't happen. Um, I am also a big music lover. I'm a singer and I play instruments, not very well, but I, I enjoy doing it. And I am a big book nerd. I read, I spend a lot of my free time reading. Uh, as Debbie was saying, I am a dedicated preventionist. I uh, worked with the, the Green Dot program for the last several years, um, getting to a lot of cool training across the country in a lot of different settings. And it's something I'm very passionate about. I definitely believe that ending violence and stopping violence before it starts is totally possible. But to do that, we need a community of people who care and people who are willing to take small actions to contribute to a safer community. Um, so it's always great to see so many people out tonight who are willing to be part of that community. 
To give you just a brief overview of where I'm coming from, uh, I am from the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Uh, the mission statement here of MCASA is that we work to help prevent sexual assault. We advocate for accessible, compassionate care for survivors of sexual violence. Um, so I am the prevention person. We have a lot of other staff doing really amazing work in the field of sexual violence prevention and response. Um, and I will give resources for our organization later in this presentation if you want to reach out about any Thing. Uh, MCASA also is home for the Sexual Assault Legal Institute, which provides comprehensive legal services to survivors of sexual violence statewide, as well as training and technical assistance for professionals working with survivors. Uh, they're also an amazing resource, and I will be giving their contact information later in the presentation. So let me give you an overview of what the next uh, not quite an hour of time will consist of. The first thing is that we're going to review some of the content that students may be learning about consent, sexual assault, and prevention. I'm doing another session tomorrow specifically designed for students where um, we'll be giving a lot of this content. So I'm giving you an example of what they'll be learning. Um, so you can be on the same wavelength about that content. Um, so you can potentially use these skills in your own life. A lot of these prevention skills are useful regardless of uh, where you are in life, whatever communities you interact with, um, or reinforce these ideas at home if your children may have questions or want to have conversations around these issues. The second thing is that we're going to be discussing more specifically how we can have I'm realizing that my hair might be brushing against my mic, so I'm moving that out of the way proactively in case that gets annoying. Um, we're going to discuss how we can have open conversations with students, help keep them safe, and support them if they ever do experience harm. Um, I'm not sure. We are going to be recording. I don't know if we started yet, but if we didn't start yet, we can go ahead and get started. It looks like we already did. Um, I will try to keep an eye out for the chat and questions as they're going through Meredith, but I'll try to keep an eye out. So if you go have questions, um, go ahead and type them in. I'll also be giving my email at the end of this presentation if anyone wants to reach out to me for more specific questions um, about prevention, um, but not specific case information. That would be a call to Sally. All right, so one thing I do want to focus on is I know that these issues have been a really hot button topic in Montgomery County. There's been um, sort of a Me Too movement or social media awareness around the me idea of Me Too where people have been sharing stories. Um, and I think that's a, a really positive shift in a way that people are being open and talking about these issues. Um, so we can really focus on prevention and we can focus on responding to things appropriately. Today, my focus is on prevention. My focus is going to be on how we can stop these things before they start, before somebody gets hurt. However, I know that there are some people who may have already been harmed and need resources, so I am going to be sharing some response resources as well. It's not going to be the primary, uh, the primary focus of this presentation, um, but I will be giving you some resources, so you can keep an eye out for those. Uh, one thing I'll say, I'll always say this when I'm doing a presentation, is this presentation will have a lot of content around sexual violence, um, consent. These are issues that can potentially be triggering or upsetting. Um, they can be hard to talk about or listen to. Um, so please take care of yourself if you do need to take a break. Um, if you need to just, you know, take a quick breather, do a stretch, do whatever you need to do. Take care of yourself during this presentation. Um, I did pop up the the contact information for BASAP, which is the local um, race, rape crisis and recovery center. Um, I see that just got popped down into the chat too. Um, so go ahead and call if you are experiencing difficulty, if this brings something up for you, that's a resource for you. With that said, um, let's dive in. So we're gonna start out by talking about the idea of consent. This is a hot button topic, um, thinking about how we can build healthy relationships for life. So why do we wanna talk about consent and why do we wanna teach students about consent? So consent is a fundamental part of all relationships, right? Like consent, um, you need consent if somebody wants to borrow a book from you. You need consent if you're ordering pizza with people and you're deciding what toppings are okay to go on the pizza, right? T consent is a fundamental building block of successful communication and successful relationship. 
as such, it's a skill that's good to start learning at a young age, right? There are age appropriate ways to teach us. So it's just this fundamental communication skill that children can learn and make part of a natural part of their behavior. Um, understanding consent can also help students communicate their values to their peers. If these are issues they care about, understanding how to talk about consent can help them share those values. It can help them obviously practice consent in all their interactions. It can also help them recognize abusive or harmful conduct from others. If you're unsure about what consent looks like, you may not be as easily able to recognize it when consent is not present. One note I'll give, just because this is something that sometimes comes up when we have these conversations, talking about consent um, and comprehensive sex education in general is not something that will increase the likelihood of teens having sex. It's not going to lower the age they're having sex. Um, it increases knowledge. It gives them skills. It will not change their behavior in that regard. Um, there is a resource there if you have any questions about that, because I know that's an argument that sometimes comes up around these discussions. So I have a quick poll. Um, this is in a moment gonna pop up on your screen. But the question I want you to think about is how comfortable do you feel talking to your children? And by children, I mean your teens, um, middle schoolers, high schoolers, whatever kids uh, you have at home. How comfortable do you feel talking to your children about consent? One, I feel comfortable talking about consent. Two, I feel uncomfortable because the subject is sensitive or personal. It's just a hard issue to talk about. Or three, I feel uncomfortable because I don't fully understand consent, right? Like you would talk to them, but you're not totally sure what you would say. Um, and do we, is the poll up? Beth, it's up, it's, it's tabulating. It is up, okay, cool. I cannot see it. Would somebody, could one of my co-hosts just give me a, give me a heads up for the results? Right now we're at about 85%. I feel comfortable talking about consent. 10% I feel uncomfortable because the subject is sensitive and personal. And 5% I feel uncomfortable because I don't fully understand consent. Okay, thank you so much. I might ask um, you all to just let me know what the polls are throughout because for some reason I'm not able to see them anymore because technology it's always a fun and exciting adventure. Um, but that's good. It's good that so many of you already feel comfortable talking about consent. It's not 100% surprising because you are all the folks who showed up on this call. This is an issue that you care about. For those of you who don't feel super comfortable, um, that's also totally understandable. It can be really uncomfortable or confusing to talk about these issues. Um, I applaud you for being on this call to possibly get some more tools because the more a framework you have to talk about it, the more tools you have to talk about it, the easier it's gonna be. All right, so you can go ahead and end that poll if you didn't already do that. I am out of the loop. Um, and let us jump into talking a little bit about what consent is. So as I mentioned, understanding consent is an important part of socializing, right? We consent to lots of different things in life, um, and it's a really important part of any healthy relationship. Um, as such, it should be introduced as early as possible. A very basic definition of consent is that I agree with something. Um, it's an agree to do something. It says, yeah, I'm okay with doing that. I want to do that. Right. Um, obviously, one of the major ways, oh, there's my co-host, Kelpie, my dog. She's barking because she agrees that consent is simple and important. Um, one of the major ways we talk about consent is in terms of sexual activity and sexual relationships, right? Consenting to engage in um, a romantic or sexual activity, whether that's something as simple as kissing or talking about sex or another sexual act. There's usually three components when we talk about consent. The first is the obvious agreement. This person wants to do this. They say they want to do it. Pretty straightforward. Then there's also the idea of free will. Sure, maybe the person agreed, but were they coerced? Were they pressured? Were the two people in the situation at an unequal power differential? Maybe one person was a lot older or in a supervisory position where we're not seeing that free will. Capacity is the final thing here. Where is that person in a position to consent? Or are they intoxicated? Um, 
Are they under the age of consent? All these different situations where even if somebody agreed of their free will, they might not have the capacity to consent. So for consent, for affirmative consent, we want all three of those elements to be uh, present. And I'll say affirmative consent, that's also a term a lot of you have probably heard. Um, affirmative consent really simply just means that consent means that somebody is actively agreeing to something. It's not just that they didn't say no, right? Like yes means yes, no means no. Those are the catchphrases you hear thrown around because consent means actively seeking consent, seeking active engagement, not just saying, well, this person didn't say no, so they probably consented, right? I'll give you another tool. This is from Planned Parenthood, and I think it's another way that we can think about some of the intricacies of consent, and it's fries. It says, I love fries. I do love fries. Many people love fries. They're great. And fries is also an acronym that can help you think about consent. So the first thing it says there is F is for freely given. And what that means is consent is given without begging. It's not based on being convinced, it's not based on a guilt trip, it's not based on threats, or it's not based on coercion. If somebody has to coerce somebody, if somebody threatens somebody, or even if somebody begs or is trying to convince somebody over and over and over before they say, okay, fine, I'll do this, that's not really the affirmative consent we wanna see. Uh, consent is reversible. Consent can be withdrawn at any time, even if the person initially agreed or they'd engaged in a sexual act before. So it's reversible. Somebody might think, you know, I, I, I want to have sex. I want to do this. I, you know, I'll go back to this person's house. I'll go on a date with this person, whatever it is, and then say, you know what? I don't actually feel that comfortable. I don't, I'm not enjoying this. At any point, they can say, I don't want to do this. That is 100% their boundaries. And I'll also say as the part the partner should be checking in to make that person sure that person is continually comfortable and consenting to whatever is going on um, it also applies if somebody is engaged in a sexual act before like if it's a couple they've had sex before um, you still need to get consent every time because consent is always reversible consent should be informed which means everyone knows the facts right they're consenting to a, a specific thing um, so if they're misinformed about certain elements that's not true consent for example if somebody says i'll consent to have sex but only if you wear a condom the other person says sure and then they take the condom off without the other person's knowledge um, that's a violation of that informed consent uh, enthusiastic. This is pretty straightforward. The people participating are happy or excited to participate. They're not just doing it because they feel uncomfortable or guilted or pressured. It's something they genuinely want to do. Um, and it's specific. I mentioned this a little bit before, but consent applies to specific actions. Somebody can be okay with, they might consent. It doesn't mean they'll consent to anything else. They might consent to oral sex or a different type of sexual activity, but then they don't feel comfortable with penetrative sex, whatever it may be. Um, it applies to specific actions. It doesn't imply consent for other actions. I got a little, my internet connection is unstable message, but it should be stabilizing now. Sorry if there was a little hiccup there. Another thing, and I've quoted this directly from Planned Parenthood because I think it's, it expresses this pretty well. Um, there are also laws about who's able to consent. So this is coming into that um, element of capacity. If the person you're with is drunk or high, asleep or passed out, below the legal age of consent or much younger than you, disabled in a way that affects their ability to understand you, then they can't consent and it's not okay for you to do anything sexual with them. Um, so when we think about capacity, that's another important thing that even if the person does agree, if they don't have capacity, then that's still not something we would consider consensual. So just to sum that up, it's a lot of information, but consent is something that is an ongoing process through any sexual encounter. In a consensual situation, each partner has the capacity to consent. There's no major power differences. There's nothing like that. Um, and each partner is responsible for checking in with their partner for consent regularly, looking for cues of agreement and interest um, and remembering fries, right, that it's freely given, reversible, informed, enthusiastic, and specific. Um, 
And when I say look for cues, there might be verbal or nonverbal cues. The thing about nonverbal cues is they can be confusing. They can be misinterpreted. It's not always so clear cut to um, read somebody's body language. But it is very easy to just check in verbally to make sure everyone's on the same page. So the lesson there is, is when in doubt, it's always important to just ask just to confirm to make sure that everybody's on the same page. It can be a really easy, simple check-in. So we're gonna do another poll. Y'all do good in this because um, a lot of people said they felt pretty comfortable with the idea of consent. Um, so I'm gonna give you three scenarios. I'm gonna read these out to you. At the end, we're gonna pop up a poll and I want you to think about which of these situations describes a good example of consent. So the first scenario here, Maya wants to have sex with her partner, Taylor, but Taylor is initially not interested. Maya gets frustrated and after asking multiple times, eventually tells Taylor that if they don't have sex soon, she'll break up with them. Taylor is scared of losing her and finally agrees. So that's scenario one, keep that in your mind. The second scenario, Keith and Aaliyah meet at a party and hit it off. They start kissing and he asks her to go somewhere more private and she agrees. However, when they're alone, she begins to feel nervous and asks him to slow down. Keith pauses and ask her, asks her if she's okay and if she wants to go back to the party. Final scenario here. Kristen and Jake meet on Tinder and agree to hang out. Kristen is nervous and drinks several beers. She starts slurring her words and feeling fuzzy. When Jake starts kissing her, she goes along with it. Um, so there are three scenarios there. What I want you to think about is which of these scenarios is a good example of consent. So again, this is the thing I can't see for some reason, but the poll should be up. Go ahead and respond. And when we start getting some answers coming in, if somebody could chime in and tell me what, what the answers are looking like. Yeah, we've got answers coming in. Um, we've got about over 90% indicating that scenario two is an example of consent. We've got 6% indicating none of them is an, is an indicator of, of consent. Yeah, that's kind of how I expected the answers to come back. Um, I think two is an example of consent. One thing that I think people might have on their minds is that these two people are at a party, maybe there's alcohol involved, um, maybe there's drugs involved, so that might confuse things, and I think that's a total valid thought. When I wrote this scenario, I wasn't necessarily thinking either of the people were intoxicated in any way, um, but um, so that wouldn't necessarily be an element. You do see some good consent behaviors here where they initially agree to go somewhere else. Um, it seems like they're both kind of okay with what's happening, um, but when Aaliyah begins to feel nervous, she asks them to slow down. And Keith kind of takes it to the next level. Like he doesn't just say like, okay, let's slow down. He actively checks in and says, hey, are you okay? Do you wanna go back to the party? Um, in the first one, clearly uh, Maya is really putting a lot of pressure and even threatening Taylor that um, they might break up. Um, so that's not really freely given consent or that's not freely given consent, I won't say really freely given, um, that's not consent. And in the third one, Kristen is clearly showing signs of intoxication, so that's also not consent. So really good answers. Um, so we're gonna move on from talking about consent a little bit, and we're gonna be talking about, specifically about sexual assault. Um, I know consent is related to that, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about sexual assault. Why is this important to talk about? Sexual assault disproportionately affects younger people, teens, young adults. When we wait too long to talk about these issues, which we often do just because they're hard, we don't necessarily wanna talk to younger people about something that's scary and can be difficult to understand. But the negative consequences there are that it might enhance stigma around reporting or disclosing. Um, really disclosing to anybody. Um, and it may also confuse teens about their experiences, right? Like if you don't know what sexual assault is or what it looks like, if you have a view that you might've seen from TV shows or think sexual assault is only a stranger in a bushes, they don't realize it can be from an acquaintance or somebody they're dating, um, that might make it really confusing for their experience. 
there are some statistics that are, are troubling. We see that more than 40% of female victims of rape were first assaulted before the age of 18. Um, we know that one in 10 high school girls and one in 10 high school boys reported being forced into sex. And one in five women and one in 16 men are sexually assaulted while in college. Uh, and those statistics don't really measure assault related to people who are transgender, who are non-binary in some way, but we do know from other study that they are um, disproportionately impacted by sexual assault. They experience sexual assault at um, very high rates compared to uh, cisgender folks. So, well, I say this not to scary statistics on screen. I say this because I want to emphasize that being aware that this is a this is a risk, this is a possibility, is important because it's a fundamental first step to both prevention and response. And I obviously just spent some time talking about consent. Um, when we talk about sexual assault and we talk about preventing harm, we talk a lot is important to healthy relationships. It's important to healthy sexuality. Um, it's how we define when sexual assault occurs, that sexual assault occurs when there is a lack of consent. But what I do wanna emphasize is that misunderstandings around consent are not the root cause of sexual violence. Sexual assault is an act of power and control. It is an intentional act that's backed up in a lot of the research um, so I don't want to say that there's never been a misunderstanding around consent. I don't want to say that. I don't hear that. But what I do want to say is sexual assault is an act of power and control. So teaching about consent cannot be the end-all be-all of our prevention work. Um, it's absolutely important, but we can do more when it comes to preventing these forms of harm. So to give you a, a bit of a definition of sexual assault. I've already kind of alluded to this, but sexual assault without consent is rape or sexual assault. Or uh, pardon me, uh, sexual activity without consent is rape or sexual assault. Pretty straightforward. Um, anyone can potentially experience an assault and it is never the fault of the victim. Uh, we know that too many young people are being impacted by it. I put some statistics up on the slide. You can probably find a lot of other statistics if you look at the research, but I'll tell you that I've read a lot of the research. I've looked at a lot of the statistics and I never saw one that felt okay, right? Even one assault is too many. So no matter what statistics we're looking at, we know too many people are being impacted. And for the rest of this presentation, what I really wanna think about is prevention. I wanna think about how we can interrupt an act of sexual assault or how we can create an environment where we're stopping harm before it ever even has a chance to start. And I wanna communicate, and I bolded this because it's important and it sounds cheesy, but it's true. Your small actions in terms of prevention can play a really huge role in keeping your community safe, especially when we have a lot of people engaged in prevention. So I want to give you some tools here about just how you can make an impact with your small behaviors. Um, so I want to give you a heads up. I'm going to be talking about bystander intervention. Uh, some of what you're seeing as I go through this prevention is me giving you the content that I'm also going to give to the students tomorrow, but also giving you kind of a look behind the curtain, a little more about the statistics, a little more about the research, about why we're taking the approach we're taking. So I'm going to be giving you some skills around bystander intervention, but since this is a parent session, I want to tell you about why I'm doing that. So as I mentioned, consent is important to enhance healthy relationship. It's important for students to feel empowered and to feel confident. Um, but consent alone, um, teaching consent alone hasn't been demonstrated to significantly reduce incidents as of assault. And I say alone because included in other programs, it is a really important skill, but teaching consent alone hasn't been shown to reduce incidents um, or just building awareness of sexual assault in general um, has to a reduction in incidents. I will say um, the approach of risk reduction, which you may have heard of, is also typically ineffective. There's been some newer programs that show some promise, but historically it's been a pretty ineffective method and it is controversial. If you don't know what I'm talking about, risk reduction is putting the burden on potential victims, which are typically 
women, this is messaging that's really geared towards women, that says that they are responsible for protecting themselves against assault. It's an approach that's well-meaning, but when it's led to saying, you know, women should be careful how they dress, they should be careful about staying out too late, um, they should be careful about drinking too much. We've often seen it as a sort of parallel to victim blaming, which is why it is an approach that's uh, often considered controversial um, or outdated. So I'm not going to be giving risk reduction strategies during this presentation. On the other hand, bystander intervention is one of the most promising prevention approaches when we look at the research. Um, there's been different studies of different bystander programs that have shown actual reductions in rates of assault, which is really huge if you think about all the people who didn't have to go through that because of a program. That's really, that's a really major accomplishment. Um, these approaches are particularly successful when they're paired with shaping social norms. So uh, to give a short a short ex explanation of what I mean by that, when more and more people are engaged in bystander intervention, when more and more people are talking about consent, it contributes to creating a safer environment. So that's, uh, this is background I'm not giving to the students, it's background I'm giving to you, um, but that is why I'm going to focus on bystander intervention. So students can have tools to, in a safe and realistic way, contribute to a safer environment. So there are three steps to bystander intervention that I'm going to go through. The first step is recognizing warning signs. So warning signs are anything you might notice as a bystander. Actually, let me rewind just a tiny bit and say a bystander is just anyone who observes something that's happening. Um, it might be a concerning situation that seems like it could potentially lead to a sexual assault. Um, and a bystander can make the choice to not do anything to be passive, um, they can make the choice to do something, to make the situation better or help the person involved. So the three steps of bystander intervention, the first step is recognizing warning signs, those cues, behaviors, things that a bystander might see, hear, notice, observe, that would let them know that maybe something is happening, um, that maybe they should be concerned about a situation. And warning signs can be super subtle. They can be very early warning signs. They could be more immediate where you might think, if I don't do something now, an assault could potentially take place. Um, a second step is considering barriers, considering the different things that might make it hard for you to intervene in a situation. Um, and the final step here is taking action using the three Ds. One thing I'll say, and I'm going to go through all these steps in more detail, but one thing I'll say before I move on is when we look at research around sexual assaults, in many cases, in the majority of cases, there was typically a bystander somewhere along the line who could have stepped in and done something. And some of those bystanders might have done something, some of them might not have. Um, so the reason we talk about bystander intervention is to give all of us, as a community of active bystanders, the tools and the resources so that the next time they see something that concerns them, they feel equipped, they feel ready to step in. So let's look a little more closely at that first step of recognizing warning signs. So warning signs can be a lot of things. Every person's different. They interact with different groups of people. Um, right now, we might not be interacting with quite as many people because we're spending time at home. But even then, you're exposed to different things on social media, when you're walking around your neighborhood park. I'll give some examples of what warning signs might look like, but this is not a complete list. There's many other things you may have seen or noticed that have sort of given you that gut feeling that an assault could potentially happen. So I'll read out the list I have here. So a warning sign could be touch that seems unwanted. Maybe the person is turning away, their face looks withdrawn, they look unhappy, they're scanning the room looking for a friend who's like, get me out of here. Um, their facial expressions might look sad, they might look uncomfortable, angry, um, flat, they might not have much expression at all. Uh, their body language might be very closed off, they might be shifting, they might be fidgeting, all these signs that we can notice that a person isn't super comfortable. 
Um, trying to get someone alone or isolated is a big warning sign. Um, testing someone's boundaries, maybe making like little jokes, making physical contact, um, trying to see how much that person can get away with and how much bystanders are gonna tolerate as well. Pushing drinks on somebody, maybe one person has one beer, but they've given somebody else four shots. Um, you might notice a friend, someone you know, a colleague, and they seem uh, really focused on someone who seems uninterested. Maybe they're texting them all the time. Maybe they're following them on social media, um, commenting on all their posts. You might see more blatant warning signs like pushing or shoving, hearing aggressive language. Maybe you'll hear someone talking about plans to hook up with somebody, um, talk about getting someone drunk, particularly when we're thinking about like teens or college students who might be go into some parties where there's alcohol and that kind of stuff going on, um, making sexist or inappropriate jokes. And I'll say these are warning signs that are, they go across a lot of different areas. Um, these are things that your that students might notice. They might notice it in high school. They might notice it when they go to college. Um, you might notice some of these in your life. Um, you might notice different warning signs. If you're Social life, um, it isn't necessarily revolving around bars or parties, but maybe you might notice things at work. Maybe you might notice things in community groups that you're part of or in your friend group. Um, you'll see different warning signs. So we're gonna pop up one, not one more poll, but we're gonna pop up another poll. And I want you to just think, have you ever observed any of these warning signs before? I gave you a list of some different ones. Um, but have you ever observed any of those warning signs? And the answers are just yes, no, I'm not sure, or no, but I've noticed other things that made me, that concerned me, a little typo there, um, because there might be some other warning signs that I didn't include on that list. So go ahead and that, answer that poll and someone can give me a heads up when we started getting some responses. That's where it about 74% say yes, 9% no, I'm not sure, 17%, and no, but I've noticed other things that made me concerned at 4%. Okay, cool. Yeah, so uh, most of us have seen the warning signs I mentioned. Other folks aren't quite sure. Some of them haven't necessarily seen these things. And I will say that often recognizing warning signs is a skill in itself. Um, I think a lot of people are socialized to kind of mind their own business. Like you don't get, if somebody's like flirting or having an interaction, we kind of just mind our own business. We're not looking, we're not noticing these warning signs or we're not aware of the warning signs. So thinking about warning signs and what we might observe in our different settings um, could be step one of bystander intervention. Because again, I'll say every person is different. Everyone interacts with different communities, with different folks who are in their friends and family. So you might notice different warning signs. And if you wanna be an effective bystander, and I'll say that for the parents on the call this day, you could absolutely be a bystander just as much as the students can. Um, start thinking about what warning signs you might notice. The other question I have, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use this as a poll, but I want you to thank for those who have seen the warning signs I mentioned, or those who may have noticed other warning signs in your life. I want you to think about what you did in that moment. And I don't say this with judgment at all, but I want you to think, did you act? Did you not act? Was it really difficult to act? And just reflect on that for a second. When I ask that, I, I say no judgment, and I 100% I mean that, because I think the truth is that almost everyone, myself included, have seen a situation where they saw a warning sign that they felt kind of concerned that something just felt not quite right about the situation, but they didn't act. Um, because that is part of being human. The truth is that everyone has barriers. They have things about intervening that make it really difficult for them. Um, intervening is hard. So step two of bystander intervention is really re reflecting on what the barriers are. What are the things that make it hard for us to step in or do something, um, even if you're seeing something that's making you uncomfortable? 
Barriers might be things like being shy or introverted, um, worry that you'll get teased or be embarrassed, like maybe you misread the situation and people are kind of going to tease you, um, feeling like it's none of your business or not wanting to be a snitch or a tattletale, um, not wanting to make things worse being unsure of what you're seeing. Uncertainty, it can be a big barrier. Like, I don't know if this is an okay situation. It might not be a big deal. If I say anything, am I just gonna be embarrassed? Um, thinking someone else will do something. Um, like if you're in a, a group where there's other people witnessing something, maybe you're out in the street and you see something happening, um, you think surely another person will help. So I don't need to help. Um, or maybe your identities make it difficult to step in. If you're from a group that experiences um, oppression or discrimination, um, and there's another group that you think that if you step forward and do something, you might experience increased discrimination, there might be negative biases towards you if you step in, that can fully be a barrier. Um, and this is a slide that is from the student presentation, so that's really who I was thinking about uh, when I wrote up these barriers. But for all of you, your barriers might be different. Your barriers might be that you're out somewhere with your children and you don't want to intervene in a situation because you don't want to put them at risk. Maybe your barrier is that you're seeing something happening at work, but if you do something, you're worried that you'll have a negative career consequences, like you're you're going to look like you're not a team player. It's going to hurt your, it's going to hurt your job performance in some way. So we all have different barriers. There's a million others that aren't on this list. So that is step two, thinking, okay, I might see some warning signs, but what are the barriers that when I see those warning signs still make it hard for me to step in? Because that brings us to our third step, perhaps the most important step, which is thinking, okay, I have these barriers. Those barriers aren't going to magically go away overnight, but even with those barriers, I have a toolkit of options. I have different ways I can intervene, even with those barriers. So we have a toolkit called the three Ds. Um, the three Ds are just two to three different ways we can intervene, um, direct, delegate, and distract. Uh, direct is just intervening directly with the person doing the harm or the person being targeted. Um, this can just be a simple check-in. It can be like, hey, are you okay? You can text someone be like, hey, I, I overheard a conversation and like I, I was feeling a little concerned. Is everything all right? Um, it can be telling someone to stop it, telling someone their behavior is inappropriate, um, telling someone like, hey, are you okay? Do you need me to stay with you if they feel unsafe? We can also delegate. There might be situations where we don't feel like we're the person best equipped to do something, but we could bring in a friend to help out. Maybe if you have like an unspoken friend or a, an outspoken friend, maybe your spouse is a little more direct. Maybe they could step in and say something. Maybe there's some other people around and you can kind of be like, hey, do you see what's happening? Do you think this is okay? Um, and the final option is distract. And distract is doing anything to disrupt or interrupt a situation to keep it from escalating. Starting a random conversation, um, making a distracting noise, dropping your bag on the ground so everyone turns and looks at you, honking a car horn if you see something happening when you're out driving. There's a million different things you can do with the three Ds. One thing I will acknowledge is that when I give a lot of these examples, they make me think of being out in public with a lot of people or in a crowded office or at a party or something like that. Most of us are probably not doing that right now, but the basic skills still apply. Whether you're doing these interventions in person or whether you're doing them on a Zoom call or on social media or, on a, or on, through text, you can use these same skills. Another thing I'll say is that we do have a module at our at MCASA called Prevention at a Distance that goes through using the 3Ds um, at a distance. Uh, so using the 3Ds through a lot of virtual means, I will put a link to that at the end of this training. But for now, I just want to do a couple quick scenarios. These are skills that you can practice in your own life, but they're also things that you can practice with your family, saying if you saw this, what are some different options you could do? So I'm gonna give you two scenarios. These are the same scenarios that are in the student presentation tomorrow. So you can uh, put yourself in the shoes of your teen um, or think about what you would do yourself. All right, so the fourth poll here, scenario one, 
You're at the park with your sibling and you see a young couple sitting together on a picked blanket. You see him leaning close to her and putting his arm around her waist, but you see her looking away and her body language is very tense. What would you be most likely to do? Your first option is to be direct. You go up to the couple, you maybe stay a safe six feet away, and you ask her if she's okay or tell him to back off. You could delegate. You could ask your sibling um, you're with if the situation seems weird and see if they can speak up. Um, maybe they're a little more direct than you are. Um, you could distract. You could just go sit on a nearby bench in the park to add a little awkwardness and really just kind of keep an eye and make sure things don't escalate. Um, or you could do a distract like walking nearby and pretending you know her, like, hey, weren't you in my chem class last year? Maybe you'd say, hey, weren't you in my daughter's chem class last year, or my son's chem class? So four different options. Um, we'll pop the poll up if it isn't already there. Think about your barriers and think about what you would be most likely to do out of those four options. Okay, so let's give people another moment. Now this one involves more reading. Okay, so we've got 7% that say they would go the direct route, going up to the couple and asking if she's okay or telling him to back off. 7% would delegate, asking the sibling, their sibling if the situation seemed weird and see if they can speak up. 66% distract, go sit on a nearby bench to add a little awkwardness to the situation. And 21% distract, walk nearby and pretend you know her. Hey, weren't you in my chem class last year? All right, awesome. So we see a variety. We see some of the distracts uh, that are popular options. They're popular options with me too. Um, they're especially good if you're not totally sure of what's happening in a situation. Like if your barrier is like, well, maybe they're just having an argument. Like they're just, you know, they're, they're kind of having a quarrel, but nothing really, that's a big deal is happening. Um, you can still use a distract to make sure that the situation doesn't escalate to kind of take a closer look at what's happening. Um, in a way that feels maybe more comfortable. And again, like what you would all do is probably different than what I would do, which is probably different than what um, your child would do. Let's look at one more of these. All right, you are in a group text with a bunch of friends. You've noticed one girl you don't know super well only will text in response to one of the boys in the group. She is super flirtatious and her comments sometimes make you uncomfortable. What are you most likely to do? The first option is direct. Make a joking comment addressing her behavior. Like, oh, funny that you popped up again. Or like, okay, that's got weird. Um, you could distract, change the subject quickly in the chat every time she starts making comments. Like, all right, let's talk about sports now. Um, you could delegate, send a private message to a few other people in the group chat and ask if you all can address it next time it happens. That's sort of power in numbers. Um, or direct, send him a message asking if her texts make him uncomfortable and if he wants you to say something to her. So go ahead in the chat, choose the option that feels most realistic for you. You can also put yourself in the, the shoes of your, your teen or your child if you don't see yourself really experiencing the situation. So we'll give everyone a moment to yeah. vote. Okay, we're seeing about 9% saying direct, make a joking comment. 14% distract, change the subject quickly in the chat every time she starts making comments. 22% delegate, sending a private message to a few other people in the group chat. And then 58% direct, sent him a message asking if her texts make him feel uncomfortable and if he wants you to say anything. Okay, cool. So folks are feeling pretty direct on that one, but they're all valid options. Uh, and that's really the point of all this is that there's not one right answer. The right answer is the action that you would actually do, right? Like the thing that feels realistic is the thing that you're going to contribute. Um, and that's really what this is about, getting more people to engage in bystander behaviors. Um, okay, let me 
pivot for a second, um, and I want to talk a little bit about what we would do for helping someone who discloses. Um, so our goal here is prevention. Our goal is to our goal is to stop people from getting hurt to begin with. Um, but there may also be moments where someone is harmed and it's really helpful to know how to help them. This slide is something that is in the presentation for the students in terms of helping a friend. I'm also going to give you a, a, some additional notes for um, if you are a pair as a parent if your child disclosed something. Um, so be supportive. That is Sounds really simple, but it's really important. Believe the person. Let them tell you their story if they want to, but don't pressure them. Um, ask them what you can do to help. Um, be there for them. And that's something if anyone you know would have disclosed to you. Be flexible. The survivor might be experiencing a lot of different emotions. There's not one way for a person to act. Um, and that person might want to go a lot of different ways. They might want to contact their local rape crisis center. Um, they might want to try to find therapeutic support. Um, they might want to spend some time alone. They might want to go to a movie and blow off steam and stop thinking about it. So again, don't expect that they should behave in one certain way, but really listen and lead and follow them. And be present because for survivors, healing is a, a process and it's not something that they do and it's done. Um, it can be a long process. They may feel different ways at different times um, and they'll need continued support. I'll say that's particularly important if your child discloses to you something. Those same rules apply. Um, be there to support them. Don't push them to tell more than they're comfortable with. Um, but let them share the story as they feel comfortable. Make it clear that you believe them. You can straight up say you believe them, but you can also just communicate that in your words and actions, that you take what happened to them seriously, that you're sorry it happened to them, and that you're there to support them. Um, and again, listen, don't interrogate, believe, don't blame. That really falls in line with what I was just saying. Um, you'll probably be experiencing a lot of emotions if that happened. I don't want to downplay that in any way. It could be a really upsetting disclosure. But in that moment, do your best to keep your emotions level because that can make it difficult for somebody who is disclosing. I'm sure they don't want to upset their parents by telling them. Um, so try to keep your emotions level in that moment so you can calmly support them um, and help them access the options, um, whatever they want to do. One thing I will say is that there are mandatory reporting laws in Maryland. Um, in Maryland, child sexual abuse um, is molestation or exploitation of a child age zero to 17 by a parent or other person who has temp permanent or temporary care or custody. Um, there's a bunch of legal language, but somebody who's in a, a custodial ar arrangement with somebody Sorry. Um, in those situations, there is mandatory reporting. If um, everyone in Maryland is a mandatory reporter, um, if there is a case that falls into those parameters, um, I did put some resources on there um, for the Department of Human Services, the Child Protective Services, um, and a phone number there. We can share these. I see we had a comment from somebody. I think the hard thing would be to avoid interrogating, um, trying to get as much information as possible to understand what happened. Listening is better, but I would find it hard to resist asking lots of questions. Yeah, that's a really fair feeling. Um, but I think your instinct at right, like listening is better. You do want to know what's happening. Um, but for anyone else, um, for anyone else who's feeling the same thing, remember that disclosing the, what happened can be really difficult. It can be extremely hard. Um, they've trusted you enough to come to you and tell you the story, um, and they're there for their support. But telling the story itself can be really difficult. Um, we don't want them to have to tell the story any more than they need. And in fact, if we are um, really interrogating them, asking a lot of questions, it may come across as that we don't believe them. Um, 
it may just make them uncomfortable. It may make them confused about what happened. Um, so it's better to avoid, really let them guide. Um, I think wanting to know what happened is totally understandable, but it is going to be a best practice to sort of listen and support. Um, and I see Debbie just uh, popped down the Montgomery County resources. Uh, I saw we had another question coming in that says, are therapists also mandatory reporters? Uh, yes, I, I believe they are. Um, I am not an attorney, so I won't say they that are. with 100% certainty. They are, thank you. Yeah, uh, Fortunately, we do have attorneys on the call. <laughs> Yeah, they license, are. The it's only part of their licensure. Yeah, okay. Um, so I know it is almost seven. I'm sorry. I do have a little bit of content. I talk too much. Um, so for anyone who needs to pop off, this is being recorded and you can view later. Um, but I'll go through and go through the last few slides here for those who can hang in there a couple minutes. So one thing that I alluded to earlier, um, and I want to just emphasize is that, oh, this is a slide I wanted to talk about, is that effective prevention begins with these individual actions. It begins with um, understanding consent, practicing bystander intervention, sharing our values. But what we really want is to have lots of people in a community engaged in these skills. Um, engaged in those behaviors um, with these really clear norms and values. So you can communicate this stuff to people in really simple ways. It could just be posting on social media, like maybe you go to this training, you post after I went to this, here's a skill I learned, um, you should do this too. Uh, talking to your friends and family about these issues maybe attending virtual community meetings, contacting government officials or school officials, um, support your children in their efforts if they're trying to share their values or, um, or advocate, um, displaying values through signage, clothing, et cetera. Um, ask a friend to attend a training like this. Um, Casa does other trainings. Um, I know MoCo, MoCo Choose Respect does other trainings, like bring a friend, bring some other people who could potentially learn these skills. Um, share media that promotes healthy sexuality or consent. Recommend a book for your book club that models good behaviors. There's lots of ways you can show that this is important for you um, and that your norms are very clear. Um, I just wanna cover one more thing for folks who are still able to stay. I wanna give you a little bit more specific guidance. You just learned a lot of information um, or learned some new skills. Um, how can you specifically put this in action to support your child? So you can play a major role in talking to your child about consent and talking about healthy relationships and preventing assault. I know a lot of people said they felt pretty comfortable talking about these issues, which is awesome. It's really great. Um, but a lot of people aren't. Um, and that, that's okay. Like, it's understandable. But if you want to start having this conversation, start by opening the door. It might feel a little awkward, but if you show your commitment to show that you're willing to talk to this about your children, it's going to be easier for them to come to you. Um, don't think of it as a one-time language one-time lecture, right? This isn't like a birds and the bees talks and then you're done. But think of it as an ongoing nuanced conversation. Maybe there are things in the news that pop up. Maybe you could talk about this training, a piece of media. Find little conversational prompts so that you can introduce the conversation in a way that feels somewhat less awkward. Um, Avoid shaming or pressuring. Uh, that can probably be a, a tendency if we are talking about sex. Um, but we really want it to be an open, judgment-free conversation so we can give information, but make sure that they feel comfortable talking to us as well. Um, if your teen uh, or your child is extremely uncomfortable in the conversation, like they are not engaging, try talking in other formats. Um, you could talk about sometimes during a bystander lens, like instead of saying like, what are some things that might happen to you that would be abusive or that would be non-consensual? You could say like, what are some things that you might notice in your friend's relationships? Or what are some things you might notice um, that you might see that you could intervene in? Sort of by depersonalizing it in that situation, you might be able to have some of these discussions. Um, you could also talk during a car ride where you're both kind of looking straight forward Already, you don't have to have too much awkward. If you have the TV on when you talk, maybe feel maybe email a notebook. If your teen is uncomfortable, if you are uncomfortable, I understand and I feel you. But um, you want to try to project an era of comfort so your 
your teen can take the lead from you. During your conversation, um, assume best intentions. Uh, you can talk to your child as someone who can be an active bystander, um, who might be um, engaging in different sexual activities, maybe in the future. Um, but assume best intentions. Assume that they want to have the skills and knowledge to keep themselves and people around safe, right? Like they don't want to violate consent. So come in with that intention that this is something that they'll want to know. Um, if you're uncomfortable about some of this content, learn together. I'm going to be giving you some resources. That's something you could potentially share with your child, but read it yourself too. Have conversations about it. It's okay to not know information, but um, learn together. Um, talk about setting and respecting boundaries, that they have 100% the right to set their own boundaries and that they need to respect others. Talk about consent and all these different dynamics that we've talked about, um, how to look out for a friend. Um, talk about what sexual assault is and how they or a friend can get help if they need it. Um, and ask open-ended questions and allow your child space to reflect. Um, one thing I'll say, because I think we may have had these questions, I'll say this real quick is whether if people are concerned their their child may have been harmed or experienced an assault um one thing that you can say is like i went to this training or um i've been learning about this and i just want you to know like i'm here for you if you ever need to talk about something really that idea of opening the door um people will disclose to you teens will disclose if they feel comfortable um so you really just want to be the safe source that they can turn to um, when they need you. Um, and what I'll say here, practice what you preach. When you're talking about consent, when you're talking about bystander intervention, um, when you're talking about setting healthy norms, try to model that in your home. Model it in the way you have conversations about stories in the media, um, in the way you talk about assaults. Um, think about your own language and your own behaviors because they'll also learn more subtly. I got a question if um, I'm going to be using the same vocabulary to present this information to students or do I modify it? I, I will probably be modifying it. Um, I'm not necessarily going to be talking about there. It, it will be a slightly different presentation in terms of um, uh, the language used. Um, so I know that we're a little bit over time. I just wanted to share some resources. I see Debbie is here. Um, I'll put these on the screen, though, as we wrap up here. I was going to also add, and I just put this in the chat, if you have questions, um, follow-up questions, or if you would like to bring a presentation like this uh, to your adult community or to teen communities that you're familiar with, um, or, if there, and, or if you would like it to be done in a different language, for example, um, please reach out to Smitha Varia, the uh, coordinator, the um, program manager for the Domestic Violence Coordinating Council. She works with the Family Justice Center, and she can follow up with you on providing additional information. We did have a question, Beth, on whether the slides could be made available to participants. I think I muted myself. Yes, I'm happy to provide these. There are resources on here um, and links, so I want you to be able to peruse those at your own pace. And I would note in the chat, there's a form to fill out for an evaluation. Um, if you could please complete that at your earliest convenience, that would be great. The target age of students for the student session, I believe is grades eight through 12, is that correct, Beth? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So typically the programming that we do through Choose Respect, there's programming geared for high school students, um, and including eighth graders. Um, and, uh, and then there's programs that we do for sixth and seventh graders that really frame things around healthy relationships. And that's based on speaking to practitioners and, um, you know, and mental health professionals and educators uh, in terms of what's appropriate for various ages. So the target age for uh, tomorrow night's program is eighth through 12th grade. Um, certainly if uh, older kids or others want to participate, uh, that works as well. I don't see any additional questions in the chat. Uh, do I have anything my student college student can participate in going into sophomore year? I would recommend they participate uh, tomorrow night as well. Um, we do have some programs, and I know that MCASA has programs geared specifically to college students. So if you were interested in getting on their mailing list, you could certainly do that. And if you want to follow the Choose Respect initiative on Facebook, Twitter, um, Snapchat, or Instagram, we are constantly posting our programs. We're going to be doing 
more programming in uh, early October in connection with Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Uh, my understanding is that Montgomery County Public Schools is going to be doing some programming in September as well. So there'll be lots of things to look out for. And we'll also be providing uh, information to the list of folks that participated tonight. I want to just take this opportunity to thank um, Beth and to thank M. Costa and her support team that's on the line with us um, for this very informative, um, interactive presentation. I know that can sometimes be a challenge uh, over Zoom, but thank you for Beth for giving us the opportunity to participate in polls and to really engage us in this incredibly important conversation. Uh, we, uh, we hope to continue the conversation. This is the beginning uh, of what we hope are many more uh, conversations, dialogues about this issue. It is so important to bring this type of uh, conversation to our kids um, and to our teenagers, because as Beth said in the beginning, I think what really resonated with me is we're not going to cause our kids to become more sexually active or to make different decisions based on having this information. We're going to empower them with this information um, and to make sure that they're not in a situation where someone else is attempting to exert power and control over them and having some level of success. And they can also be there to support their friends and everything else that Beth described tonight. So thank you again for taking your time um, this evening and uh, thank you for sticking with us as we ran over. And please follow up with additional questions. I believe the chat will remain available for a period of time and have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thanks for coming.